so also welcome from for me on the uh, presentation on your game plan for building a knowledge graph to fair data platform so uh, a few words on myself uh, my name is uh, sebastian schmidt as, as george mentioned i'm co-ceo at metafacts um so i'm uh, running the company together with uh, peter hase who founded it in 2014. um I actually come from a, a cloud and, and uh, infrastructure background, um, but have always been a, a big fan of knowledge graphs. And um, uh, I'm happy for being about one and a half years part of a, a truly digital business and working with a lot of uh, knowledge graph experts, uh, key people behind, uh, for example, the, the OWL draft or also pushing on, on new topics like uh, RDF star and Sparkle star. So um, who is MetaFacts? Um, as I said, uh, we started out in 2014. We are based out of uh, Waldorf, Germany, and uh, we have a, an international team really uh, across multiple locations from uh, Australia, Germany, uh, Russia, um, Ireland, um, all over the globe. Uh, we have uh, one product, which is MetaFactory, our knowledge graph platform. And we use that product uh, to drive digital transformation with our customers. And that's specifically around um, unlocking the value of the data assets uh, using knowledge graphs as the underlying technology stack. And what I want to present today is an approach uh, we have implemented with a, a number of customers in, in different verticals. So we are working with customers in, in cultural heritage and digital humanities, in engineering, manufacturing, finance, insurance, pharma, and, and life science. And we have built uh, knowledge graph-based applications and, and tools from um, bill of material management to a, a digital museum, um, solutions like for, for drug discovery and, and drug repurposing, so um, really a lot of different domains where we bring in the, the expertise of how do you build a knowledge graph and um, how can you do that really fast. And our customers bring in their specific uh, domain expertise. So um, what is it about uh, digital transformation? Where do we see uh, this demand uh, coming from for building such knowledge graphs? We see that um, a number of uh, drivers are behind why companies want to uh, establish a digital transformation strategy from um, really just enabling innovation, bringing new products to the market, uh, driving additional business to uh, increasing engagement with uh, the employees, internal customers, partners, um, to improving operations. So, uh, very often it's also just an, an internally focused effort to make sure that internal processes run smoother, access to relevant information is available at the time it's needed and uh, is complete and is reliable. When talking about how to get to digital transformation, this is something you, you might have seen before. Um, so there's this approach of uh, first talk to people, uh, talk to your customers, talk to your partners, talk to your employees and understand the gaps and the needs. Uh, then it is finding the right data, using the data in the right way to drive digital processes and with those uh, digital processes to support them with digital tools. The approach we are taking on that is, is a truly agile approach and I'm gonna um, highlight that a few times throughout the presentation. So it's all about planning, building, testing those individual steps and um, iterations on each of those steps as needed. Uh, so wherever we are in that process, uh, the idea is you can at any time go back to the previous steps, um, fill gaps that you identified later on, retest uh, new hypotheses and, and make sure that you are actually achieving um, the, the goal that you have set out. And it might even be adjusting that goal um, as you are going along. This is a, a lot of ground to cover. So today I'm gonna to focus really uh, purely on the, the data aspect of this. So how do we build a uh, FAIR data? So FAIR data that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data. 
And I will highlight uh, three of the, the key uh, steps we see, which is describing your data, modeling your data, and then using your data. As mentioned, uh, we are using the uh, semantic web knowledge graph uh, standard for that to derive knowledge from this data and to also further uh, drive prediction with uh, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. So when we talk about data and digital transformation, uh, most of our projects actually start from the, the point of looking at what kind of data is available. And I think there's uh, no enterprise that has a, a lack of available data. But the challenge is usually about um, what can I actually do with this data? Is this uh, relevant data for what I want to achieve here? Uh, who created it? So who can I reach out to to get more detail about it? Which processing steps have been applied to this data? Is this um, in some way modified? How do I interpret that correctly? Is that uh, reliable data? So do I have contradicting data available or other data that is uh, supporting the information I uh, derived from it? Um, where and, and when was it created? So is it still relevant? And what was the intended use? So with what uh, idea was it initially created and, and does that properly apply to um, what I'm planning to do with it? And there are a, a number of approaches we see that our customers have taken to answer those questions and get a better understanding of their data. The most successful approach at describing your data is, is really taking all of your data, all of those digital assets in the same way. Meaning that could be any kind of private data or public data that is not yet cataloged, that is just existing in, in some way in your enterprise or existing catalog solutions you might have already established, which we very often see are, are building on proprietary standards, are building mostly um, as a siloed solution. So uh, most customers I'm working with have actually two or three catalog solutions in place, uh, none of them covering, let's say, a, a very significant part of the data. It's, it's usually in the range of 20, maybe 30%. And the idea is bringing in uh, documentation, provenance, and lineage. And what we are proposing for that is, is building on those uh, W3C standards. So building on the RDF data format to build a semantic data catalog and using uh, vocabularies from, from DCAT and Bravo to, uh, on the one side with DCAT, model really what kind of data that is, where it comes from, um, and, and how you can reach out to get more information about it, how you can get to the actual source of that data, and combining that with Bravo to understand the kind of transformations, modifications that have happened to the data and um, what happened before this data actually reached uh, the, the system where you are interacting with it now. So to make it a little bit more visual, um, I have a demo. I have a fallback version as a video, but let's try if we can maybe have the actual demo system. So this is our uh, Meta Factory tool. And um, we have a, a number of asset management interfaces built in here. And I want to start out from the data cataloging uh, interface here. So what we can see is um, all of those different uh, properties defined in, um, in DCAT to uh, filter the available uh, data sets we have in the system. We, for example, can look at uh, the linked Nobel Prize data set here. We can uh, look at that. And what we are doing is we, we populate uh, a page in uh, some kind of a linked data browser kind of concept. So we are now on, the, uh, on that individual data set. We get information about this data set. Um, we can see the, the URI and the, the type of this uh, data set we have here. Um, it is possible to, to modify the data set. And um, all of those configurations are directly loaded from the, the DCAT model. So the, the model that's defined with that DCAT standard, that open standard is directly driving the user interface and um, how information is presented. 
From here, I can also explore the graph that's behind it. So I can, for example, see all of the incoming and outgoing links for this data set. I can see the, the publisher. Um, I can also look into the, the model information so I can see of, uh, of type data set. And I can see there are a number of other uh, resources that are of that same uh, type. So we can um, take one of those in as well and, and see the, the different kind of data sets we have in our knowledge graph and really navigate from one resource to the other and, and get a better understanding. Um, we have uh, auto-populating knowledge uh, panels that show you context information about everything in that knowledge graph. And through that, you can really browse your data sets and build a central system driven by an open standard, by an open data model, where you can learn about all the different uh, data sets that uh, are available to you and that you are working with in your company. Now, the, the next step is uh, modeling your data. So now that we actually have information about where this data comes from, what kind of data that is, and um, where we get to, to more information about it, it is very important to put a, a model on. And I'm not talking about a, a classical relational database model or something like that. So this is not to describe the, um, the, the structure, the, the data types of my data, but this is about describing my domain model. Um, because it's very important if you want to be effective in using the data at hand, that you describe uh, what kind of data it actually is and, and how the different concepts and relations are interacting in your specific data set. So what we are seeing here is a case from, uh, from pharma domain, where we have a, a number of data sources in our data catalog, and we are showing here how those uh, public available data sources actually interlink on a, on a higher level uh, model. So we see that we have uh, genes and, and proteins and, and transcripts, which are all uh, subclasses of biomolecular entities. And we see how a protein connects to a pathway. So without actually being in the pharma domain, I can get a basic understanding of, of what kind of things are modeled in this data, um, what kind of information I can extract from that. And that's, that's the idea of this approach. We are using uh, the OWL and, and Shackle standards for that. So, so most of what you're seeing here is, is actually modeled through OWL. But we see that uh, you also want to model things like constraints. So you might want to define um, this relationship between gene and, and protein. So this encodes relationship we have here. Um, how many uh, proteins can be um, encoded by a gene. And to define that, uh, OWL doesn't, doesn't give you any way to do that. So that's why we're combining it with Shackle to allow you to model those constraints as well. So uh, again, how does that work? So from the, the perspective of MetaFactory, that's a, just a, another asset. So um, in this case, we're looking at an ontology asset. Uh, you can also see that we have uh, an integration with, with Git here. So those are all not versioned in Git right now, but we have, again, the, the Nobel Prize data set here. Uh, we see uh, this is versioned in Git with no active changes on this. And we can go into that now, and we can really um, modify our model here. So what we see are, again, the, the core concepts of this data set. We are seeing uh, those constraints, like there's an exact one uh, relation between a word file and, and file type. Um, and one common step you would want to do is, uh, after you have actually built the, the ontology, which you can do in here, so you can, can modify um, parts of the ontology, you can add relations, you can um, add additional classes. 
but you can also tie it into um, other ontologies. So we see a lot of uh, customers building kind of a, a more a higher level ontology uh, where all of the, the specific domain ontologies can tie into. And that's also why you're seeing such a, a lot of, of classes in here. So if we, for example, would only look at the, the local ontology, you can see it's, it's a lot less here. So let me quickly jump back to, to all ontologies and um, pick out uh, something that does not come from this ontology itself, but comes from a, another ontology. So for example, um, we pick out the, the agent and uh, the document. We can see that for them, there are already relations defined. And now we can go here and say that an award file, I'll take the subclass relation, is actually a subclass of a document. Uh, below here, this is actually a, a subclass of an, of an agent. And now we can uh, save this change. And we can also now do validation. So we can actually see how much of our data is conformant to this model. So if I'm going back to my um, ontologies, I can do a, a validation step here. And we should now get a new entry here for a new data quality report. And we can see that um, with our latest report, we have a few elements which are not conformant um, with our model. So we can right away go in here and we can learn that um, the minimum cardinality for, for file type and for year is not uh, correctly set for some of those elements. And we can now learn also which specific node does not provide it. So for example, here we see the, the price file and that leads back again to our um, uh, linked data browser. So the idea is really that everything is in the knowledge graph. The catalog is in the knowledge graph, the model is in the knowledge graph, and also the data validation information is part of that knowledge graph and everything is interlinked and can be accessed from every point um, of uh, where you are in your data set. Um, the deontology or your schema, your model, that's one piece. The other one is uh, bringing that together with a, a controlled vocabulary. Uh, we are using SCOS for that. So you see an example where uh, we are modeling um, the, the control vocabulary for diseases in this case. And then um, we have built that system so that you have interfaces for specific user types. So we are seeing more and more customers adopting the, the ideas of a semantic modeler being responsible for that overall modeling process, uh, kind of the, the gatekeeper to the model. Uh, domain experts actively participating in modeling as well as uh, building out the vocabularies and data stewards that have some um, interaction with those, those models or also ontologies, but are mostly active around building the data catalog, bringing the data into the system, mapping it into models and vocabularies and making it available. To support that uh, process, and, and I don't really have time to talk about that a lot, um, but we have also implemented the W3C Reconciliation Service API uh, draft. So you can use that to have a standardized interface to look up what is the idea, the, the ID for one of my uh, resources or, or entities. Um, so every new data set and all the new data you are bringing into your knowledge graph will correctly map into what's available already. So the, the third and final step is using your data. And that's interestingly one that's often um, overlooked when knowledge graphs are built in the beginning. Um, and that has been uh, one of our focus points all along. So we together with our customers built uh, wireframes. So really discussing the, the requirements from, from data, people, processes for the user experience, and then take that into MetaFactory, which is also uh, a model-driven low-code platform so that that linked data browser you saw, as well as all the interfaces, they are highly customizable, which means they are just HTML pages um, that are 
are connected to a number of, of templates where we use our uh, predefined and graph enabled components to put those visualizations and interfaces together. And everything that you would like to have in a different way, you can modify. Uh, this all sits on top of a, a graph database where the data is stored. And all of the configuration, like you saw it for the model, but also for those template pages is stored in a versioning system, uh, which makes ultimately the, the platform itself a stateless component that's just putting the things together and creating the interface to interact with it. Um, or in the same way, providing that uh, through APIs to a, a larger ecosystem of analytics, prediction, AI, ML solutions. We do have a, a public demo system based on uh, Wikidata. And um, if, you, if you open that system on wikidata.metafacts.com, there is an example gallery of some of the components we provide. And I, I just want to show you uh, two examples quickly. Um, so there is one option here to combine a, a keyword search with a, a tree visualization. So we are seeing the, uh, the tree of um, yeah, uh, diseases here and, and how that, that connects in this uh, taxonomy called MESH. And here we can look behind the cover of how this is actually built. So what you see is it is our tree component. It has a query to find um, parents and it has a query to do the, the keyword lookup. And interestingly, you can also see that we are also federating here over a number of repositories combining mesh with Wikidata. So these few lines give you that user interface um, that you're seeing here where you can freely interact with this data which means if you are uh, able to write a Sparkle query, you are actually able to write a front-end interface in MetaFactory. And if you are not able to write a Sparkle query, we have an interactive query builder. So you can actually say, I'm looking for a person connected to an organization where that organization is the employer and where that organization is related to a place, which is the headquarter location. And that might be London. And now we select the London we are interested in. And now we get a result and, and we can extract the Sparkle query from that. We can also combine it with AND and OR clauses and make it obviously a lot more complex query. But through that, I can derive my result that I can derive a, um, an actual Sparkle query that I can use then in those visualizations. Or I can even provide that as a query builder to my end users to interact with the data set. So we have built a number of systems, as I said, um, it's probably around 100 applications we have built with our customers in the last years. Um, just some few examples here. And um, as I mentioned it before, all of this is following this agile approach. So um, that's also true for all of those assets, data sets, mappings, ontologies, vocabularies, as well as the, the UI templates. For all of them, we are following an agile pro approach with uh, versioning in, in Git and relevant governance processes around it. And the idea is that with that approach, you can really go from a proof of concept um, in just one to two weeks to an, an MVP um, and a, a production system in a month or even less. So we have successfully implemented that for, for some use cases in, in just two weeks, getting something to the end user uh, being able to iterate in uh, weekly sprints, getting feedback in, getting additional data sources in, expanding the model, expanding the vocabulary, and so on. So, um, yeah, with that, uh, I think I'm at the end of the, the 25 minutes. Uh, yeah, that, that was the end of the 25 minutes. Uh, and that was also me muting Sebastian. What I wanted to do was actually enable my screen, Sebastian, for, for shutting off your, your stream. Uh, at least it, it happened after you had finished your, your talk. So uh, it's a good time to open the floor to questions. And we already have one, actually. Uh, we've had that 
almost since the uh, the beginning of your talk. It's uh, one from Dean Aleman. It's a very specific one. So if uh, Dean will allow me, I will uh, broaden in the, the scope a little bit. So uh, Dean's question is, if someone's already using Colibra for their data catalog, is there an easy way to migrate that into a knowledge graph like the one uh, you showed in your slides? I would expand the scope a little bit uh, because well, uh, the question, <coughs> excuse me, the question is specifically about one data catalog uh, mm -hmm. solution. There are there are many in the market, so I would generalize. Like, is there a way for someone who's using some whatever other data cataloging solution to to, to transition, let's say, to what you're using? Um, so we are seeing that specifically, a uh, specific one quite a lot, actually. Um, so I would say it's uh, it's part of like 80% of the solutions we have built around uh, data cataloging. Um, and we are not yet where we want to be with that. So um, as we, for example, have um, also enhanced capabilities around uh, the, the visual ontology building uh, just with the last release to the, the point that you saw just now, um, we are also looking into how we can make that um, onboarding of existing catalogs smoother and, and easier. Um, right now, there's there's some manual process still involved with that. Um, but we, we see that uh, over the, I would say, next year, this becomes a, a highly automated process uh, to, to speed up those projects uh, even further. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, we also have, again, a rather specific question from, from Daniel. Uh, I don't know if it's one you can answer, but I'm going to pass it on anyway. Uh, he asks about pricing and whether you provide licenses for research purposes. Yes, so we, um, we are ourselves very active in research, so we also want to support uh, research. And, and therefore, um, if you are interested in an, an academic license or something like that, um, reach out. Um, we have uh, under metafacts.com slash get minus started. We have a, a public trial that's accessible to, to everyone. Um, you can run this in the cloud or on premises. And um, if you have a, a research academic need, um, just put that into the uh, the comment field or reach out via email and we'll give you uh, directly access uh, to that. Okay. Uh, actually, I also have a question for you uh, because at some point you mentioned the agile approach and uh, iteration and versioning, but for data. And this is something that I see coming up actually a lot, uh, mm -hmm. increasingly, I would say, and beyond the, the confines of data cataloging or knowledge graphs or what have you. It's something that's, 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 there is a need for, uh, and it's getting more widespread. So even for people doing machine learning or any dealing with, with data and data science in any other capacity, let's say, because people are realizing it's a bit like code, so you do have iteration, so your data set will change, your data set will evolve over time, so you need a way to keep track of that and different versions and which version everyone has and all of that. So how do yeah. you uh, approach and resolve this, this issue in your platform? Mm -hmm. So for, for UI templates, for ontologies, for vocabularies, it's fairly straightforward because the, the amount of data is, is usually quite controllable and, and uh, the approach with uh, using a versioning system like Git for that um, is, is what's implemented most of the time. For data, it becomes a little bit more tricky because sometimes that's just not the approach that's that's relevant or interesting there. So we have a number of ways how we can do the, the versioning there. Um, we are, for example, working with uh, different uh, named graphs. So depending on the technology that's underneath in the database available, to provide kind of a, a staging area for data sets um, or other approaches are around um, maintaining specific user changes. So we also have the, the capabilities of providing those forms and every change is then tracked with provenance information from the user and versioning information. So you can actually play back all the changes that, that users have into, entered into the system. And in the same way, you can also do that for, for other ways how data might get into that system. Um, so for, for data, it's still a little uh, custom based on the specific need. Uh, I think there's, there's no one way to do it right. Uh, but we have uh, implemented that from just small scale to, to large scale changes. And we, we have approaches to, to help with that. 
Okay. Yeah, I think the uh, the named graph um, solution that you mentioned uh, makes makes sense. Uh, but as you also pointed out, there is currently, to the best of my knowledge, at least not a standardized way to uh, to move between different name graphs. So I guess you have to somehow add some proprietary elements to that. It's it's actually we're not really applying a proprietary element, um, other than you know maybe a kind of a an extension to the vocabulary that we specifically use for that. It still stays RDF, it still stays um, open and standardized. And what we can, for example, also employ for that is, is LDP containers. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's another technical approach uh, to help us uh, enable that. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was just specifically interested in that because, yeah, as I said, and you also mentioned it's it's an issue uh, that many and many more organizations are facing. So I was just curious how you deal with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to be wrapping up so that uh, people can move on to uh, the next session. Thanks, everyone. Bye.